Well, many years ago, I climbed up to the top of a 14,000-foot mountain in a place called Durango, Colorado. Now, for those of you who are from Miami or some of the other Florida flatlands, maybe here the highest hill is the city dump. It's affectionately known as Mount Trashmore. Maybe some of you have climbed it. But a 14,000-foot peak, it's not quite there yet. And for many of you, maybe it's hard to picture something that tall. And among hikers, a 14,000-foot peak, well, it's kind of the cutoff between a big mountain and a really, really big mountain. See, 14,000 feet above sea level, it's also known as the timber line because it's at that point that even trees really can't survive. Uh, at that elevation. Not enough oxygen for them, and the weather extremes that go on are really too great. And so that day at Durango really kind of set out with a, a casual group of about 20 friends taking a leisurely little hike. We had no intentions really of going up this mountain, no aspirations to it, in fact. We were just kind of going along the foot of the mountain there, and it's an easy tourist trail. If you've ever been on one of those, it's one of those things that kind of makes someone think they've been in the mountains, think they've been hiking, but they really haven't. They've just been around the base. And then suddenly someone in our group, I don't even remember who it was, but they looked up at the summit of that massive mountain and they said, man, I bet the view from up there is really, really cool, but I guess we'll never know. Now that was all I needed to hear. I guess we'll never know. Well, then I need to know. See, growing up, I was one of those people who would pretty much do anything on a dare. Hopefully, in some ways, the Lord has taught me a few things. But everything from licking an ant pile to putting an entire Big Mac in my mouth at once, these were things that if somebody dared me to do it, I'd say, well, let's see if we can. And so this was one of those things. I really had a couple of friends there that were closer in the group, and they were what I would call adventurous idiots. And so here we were, these three who broke out from the group of 20 and said, we're going to see not only the view from the valley today, but we're going to see the peak at the peak. We're going to take a look at the top of that mountain. And I think all of us simultaneously kind of heard the Indiana Jones theme song. You know, the one, dun 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 dun, dun. And we thought, for the honor of all humanity, we are going to climb that mountain. We are going to reach that peak, and we are going to enjoy that view. And our eyes will see what no man has seen before. And so... We left that little tourist trail and the rest of our group behind. And we kind of hugged them and kissed them, not knowing if we'd ever see them again. You see, we hadn't planned to take this trip. I remind you, we really had no provisions for that hike there. We had only a little bit of water and really no food at all. And we weren't dressed appropriately for that kind of trek. But we were going to take a peek at the peak, or we were going to die trying. Now, it quickly began to look like die trying. See, the first part of this hike, it was heavy vegetation. There was no trail that we were taking there at this point, and, and so we got scratched, we got whipped by branches, we were tangled in vines, and I began to think, what in the world are we doing? See, I wouldn't say it out loud, because we still had that kind of gung-ho, we're going to hit the top kind of attitude with each other, but inside, I think we were all thinking a little bit of, hmm, what were we thinking? A journey through the jungle. This was supposed to be the mountaintop. I don't know what's happening here, and so we had that going on in our mind. And every so often, we would break through the brush there and get another peek at that peak. And we would be reminded then at that point, oh, yeah, that's why we're doing this. We want to see that view. And so after a few hours of hiking through this, the terrain changed. See, the middle part of the mountain then was a little different than the bottom. The middle part was this endless expanse upward with what are called false peaks. Now, if you've ever done any mountain climbing at all, you know what a false peak is. A false peak is that as you climb, well, you have to set your sights on something. If you don't have a goal, you'll give up. You'll go back. And so what you look for is the highest point that you can see from that perspective. And so you walk toward that, and you keep telling yourself, well, I'm almost there. I can see the top from here. It's, it's just around the next corner. I can see it. But see, a, a false peak there is when you finally come to what you thought was the very tippy top, and you find out, no, from this new perspective, I can see a higher point. I can see another spot that's a little way further. And that's just that false peak. But it does give you some true hope, because along the way, you start saying, oh, I'm walking on. But from that perspective, from this new perspective, I can see points I couldn't before. And I've gone, at this point, far too far to give up and to go back. 
And see, the last time, the last part of that climb, it was actually above timberline. As I said there, where the trees don't even grow. They're smarter than we were. They don't go there. And you see the vegetation and all those things have, at that point, become very, very sparse. At this place in the mountain, it was just a bunch of big rocks, a bunch of boulder fields, as they call them. And oxygen was in short supply. Now, in a way, we had oxygen in short supply at the bottom of the mountain, and we never would have done this, but, but your mind begins to kind of get messed with at this point, and we found ourselves down on all fours, kind of crawling along, really. That was it. And just a few steps at a time. The last part took, it seemed like, forever. We had made some pretty good progress in other parts, but that last little bit was so difficult. And we found ourselves there again, just taking a few steps, catching our breath. And by this point, we were quite a sight to see. We were looking to go see the sights, but really we became kind of a sight. We looked at each other and said, man, I hope I don't look as bad as these two guys do. Because they were all dirty and sweaty and bruised and bleeding from all the scrapes and little falls that we'd had along the way. And yet we pressed on to that peak, driven by that dream. We will be the first and only humans to ever lay sight on the top of this mountain. And finally, as you saw it there, the three of us came over the top of that final ridge. And we did see a breathtaking view. It was beautiful, just as we had hoped. And there was also something else we saw. A nice little rest area from which to view it, complete with benches and picnic tables and a little Kodak moment sign for us to take it had we had a camera. Now, I haven't been there in a few years back to that spot, but see, by now there's probably a Starbucks, a Super Walmart, all the rest of the comforts that you could possibly have because, see, we weren't the first to make it up that mountain. We weren't the first ones to say, hey, I want to see the view not from the valley but from the top. And it turns out that there was a winding road, see, up the back side of the mountain. You could have driven it in about half an hour. Now, had we done that, we would have seen the ex exact same view, wouldn't we? Or would we? Would we have seen the same view? See, I would venture to say that the journey was part of the view that we saw. We saw that from every direction that you could possibly see it on the way up, and it meant more to us when we got to the top. See, some would say, oh, you know, I'd really prefer to go in the air-conditioned SUV. You know, the off-road vehicles we all have that never go off-road. And, and so I'd like to just go up that little thing and I'd, I'd like my little cooler or bottled water along the way so I never have any hassles. And some of you are thinking, yeah, I could do that kind of mountain climbing. That's my way. But see, this is one I want us to think about tonight, which is that the value of the view is often related to what you went through. The value of the view is often related to what you went through to finally see it. And see, the three of us there, we didn't take this view from the top of this mountain for granted. We didn't just kind of look there and, and say, yeah, well, there it is. Let's get back in the car. No, we stood there. We soaked it all in. We celebrated. We reveled in the moment. We rejoiced in it. And we valued that view so highly because it didn't come easy. And see, if you think about it this way, it relates so much to tonight's teaching, which is titled, A Peak at the Peak. And it's kind of like this. Romans 8, if you think of it this way, it's the top of a tall truth. It is the peak of a massive spiritual mountain. And the glory and the majesty that we've seen in the gospel, I really believe it reaches its pinnacle, its peak in this passage. Now, there's more to the book, and there's many more views to see, but there's something about Romans 8 that it's really the pinnacle. And I've looked forward to teaching this, and I appreciate Pedro giving me the opportunity to do so, to reach this peak, to teach this peak. But I remind you, even as we go through it kind of quickly, it's just a peak at the peak. It's just a little bitty look. It's not a long glimpse. It's really just a few minutes that we spend in it here tonight. But in it, we get a glimpse a fresh look at the greatness of God's majesty. See, we could look at Romans 8 for the rest of our lives and the rest of eternity, really, the truths that are in here. And I hope we will, and I know we will, and never get tired of its glorious truths that are here. There's so much more than we'll even be able to look at tonight. But one of the glories, the great glories of mountain climbing is reaching that summit, whichever way you come to it. 
And there's a sense of relief. There's a sense of release there when you finally get to that goal and you say, I am there, I am at the top. And I remind you, the value of the view is so often related to what you went through, what you went through to see it. See, Paul's taken us to this peak, but he didn't really kind of drive up the shortcut in the back. He didn't take the quick trip. No, in a way, he really took the tough trek with us. And I hope we value the view as we get to Romans 8. See, it was through that dense vegetation there in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. You see, at times you couldn't even see the sky. It's so dark. No one righteous. No, not one. I mean, there's certainly a lot of condemnation in chapter 1. The wages of sin is death. And you say, man, I thought I was climbing a mountain here. I thought there were going to be glorious views here in the gospel. I thought this was good news. And yet there's a lot of bad news right up front. And if... Some of us maybe came out of that a little scratched and bruised spiritually and said, wow, what was that? And had in our minds, why are we going through this? And yet you see the upward call there with even, in a way, some false peaks in Romans 4, 5, and 6. Now, I'm not saying that they're false hoods. They're not that. But there's some points along the trip that Paul's laying some foundation here as we're going ever higher in his, his explanation of the gospel. He's taking us up so that we can get a new perspective and we can go from that point and say, oh, there's even some more things that we need to know. There's some things that we need to grow in and understand. And it's a promise of the peak so often, just a little peek at it that keeps us going that says, hey, there is a life ahead. Sometimes it seems far away, the life of faith. It seems like it's way out there in the distance somewhere and other people maybe seem to have it and we don't and things like that. And see, last week, that's what we went through in chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, it was kind of like that boulder field. Remember when I said above the timber line, it's like very difficult terrain. It's not the kind of thing that you just waltz along quickly or run through without a care. See, it's at that point that your mind really begins to say, look, I just can't make it. I, I know we're close, but I'm just going to roll back down the hill now. You know, I just, just forget me. You know, come back and save me when you get here, you know, or whatever. You guys go on, you know, all that kind of hero stuff that people do. No, and it's like you're down there saying, it's just too hard. I can't make it. And maybe some of you have lived part of your Christian life. Maybe you're even there tonight where you say, this is impossible. And that's a conclusion that God wants us to come to. But see, he's not wanting us to want to fall back and, think that we're failures, not at all. No, he wants us to press on because right over that little hump there in Romans chapter 7 is a peak at the peak. See, we're way too close to the top to stop now. Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. It's like he's crawling on all fours, fighting for the next breath and the next step. And he says, who's going to deliver me? How am I ever going to get out of this? And it's with that introduction, that understanding, that view in our mind that we come to God's grace in all its glory. And this is the view, and I hope we value it because of what we went through to get here. Not only scripturally, but experientially. Because many of us know this exact journey in our life. So you get to chapter 8, verse 1, and I love it. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not hike according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law, I put that in, it's do not walk in your Bibles, I know. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now that's a couple of words we need to memorize. Some people say, I can't memorize Scripture. At least memorize this part of it. No condemnation. And again, I remind you, the value of the view depends on what you went through. To get there so often we can take something for granted that may be an incredible view and yet if we didn't go through anything to get there we say yeah <sighs> what's next see in Romans 8 1 may not mean much to you maybe if you've never known what it is to struggle with sin and lose badly over and over and over again see sometimes in children's ministry we'll talk about sin and Kids, though they're little sinners, they don't really even understand sin and its consequences sometimes. They just think of it in kind of real minor terms, you know. But to just have a family ripped apart by sin, well, then sometimes all of a sudden we understand a little bit more what it means. See, if, if we've never had to pay the price for sin in our own lives and, and try to do things in pride and self-sufficiency and I'm going to make it to the top of that mountain myself, I don't need God to do it, well, then we can have maybe no real 
excitement when we see those words, no condemnation. If we've never known what it is to have that desperate, burning desire to be pleasing to God, to live a life of value and purpose and reality in spiritual things, and just felt like such a failure, and to fall down again and just say, Lord, that's it. I'm just rolling to the bottom. Forget it. Oh, wretched me. See, that's where Paul was at that point, where he finally came to the end of his own ability, and he said, you know what? I need some help here. And if someone were to take, if you will, the spiritual shortcut to Romans 8, if such a thing might exist, they might say, oh, well, I turn to it, I see it tonight, nice view, nice verse, what's for dinner? But see, no condemnation, that should change our lives. It's more than just, hey, take a picture and get back in the car and forget all about it. It's something that we say, I've got to live here. I've got I to gotta move my whole existence to this spot. You know, that's what we kind of do when we're up at the top of that mountain. We say, this is where I want to live. This is what my life needs to be about. And see, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, that's what the Bible says. Sometimes you can get pretty hungry in life and pretty thirsty in life. And you can desire to fight that fight of faith and you can feel like you lost. And there you have it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you've done that, you thought. And you start to see sin for what it is, which is death. And even as a believer, you find that sin still can be working within even when you're trying and even when you're saying, Lord, I thought this was all going to be over when I came to you. And yet we see that glimpse, the peak at the peak, and we see God's grace, and we see all that God can mean to somebody. And see, righteousness to some, it seems way out of reach. It's like, well, you know, it must look great from up there, but I guess we'll never know. But I hope there's something in you that when you hear someone say something like that, you say, well, then I got to know. There's no way I can just stay down here in this valley See, it makes you want to shout when you get to the top of a mountain and you've gone through all these different things maybe and you're standing there in all the glory of it and you just want to stand up and say, yes, I am where I am supposed to be. I am where I wanted to be all this time. And see, the words, no condemnation, they're supposed to come to us like that as we read through Romans and we get to the top of that hill and God says, now therefore, after all I took you through to understand these things, no condemnation. There's no condemnation there. And so I want to read it with us again. And it says there, there, is no, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk, who do not hike according to the flesh, but according, according to the Spirit. Now, the Bible is full of contrast, and this chapter is no exception. A lot of contrast in this chapter here before, uh, with the life before Christ, the life after Christ, and even the life in Christ, but not walking in the fullness of the Spirit. See, those are things that we have to come to understand, that there's lots of different ways in the mountain that people are. And you see this chapter of contrast here, one of the first things it talks about here is no condemnation. And we need to know the difference between two words. If you write them down or you think through them, it's condemnation and conviction. See, as a Christian, we desperately want and need conviction, but we can reject condemnation. What's the difference? Condemnation is that thing of, hey, I'm sure the view is great from up there, the heights of holy living, but I guess we'll never know. And as you have your first fall or your first failure, you run from God. You hide from Him. You listen to the voice of that accusation that says, this is the way you've always been, this is the way you will always be, and you might as well just give up. You might as well just go back to your old life. You better forget about it. And so then you see conviction. Conviction is such a different thing. Instead of drawing you toward sin and away from God and into that guilty life of, ah, it's not for me. No, you see conviction, it draws you toward God. It draws you upward. It's that voice that says, you don't have to live in the valley. You don't have to stay there. That doesn't have to be your address. And you can start to say, I don't want to live life at the lowest level of existence. 
I don't want to kind of squeak in by God's grace so it's, oh, well, I took the free gift of salvation and I guess I'll just sit on it here at the base of the mountain. And I'm not going anywhere. I'm just going to be down here and, hey, it's better than nothing. But you know what? God has such a better view for us than the valley view. That's not where we're supposed to live as Christians. He's calling us always to the top. He's saying, hey, there's a spiritual summit. There's a journey for you to take. And you know what? He's going to give us a peek at the peak, and there's going to be a lot more than just that. We're going to get to live there for all, all eternity at the highest of spiritual heights. But he at least gets us a little glimpse right now. We can have a foreshadow of it. And he's here contrasting that, saying, hey, you don't have to live with condemnation. And then you see the contrast of two laws, two important contrasts here. He talks about the law of sin and death. And then he talks about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So just think of those two laws right there, two different laws. Law of sin and death, if you have notes with you or you want to write it in your Bible, write the word gravity next to it. I think that's a great physical law that gives you a picture of the spiritual law. Gravity, what does gravity do? Well, it holds us down, right? Part of the reason it's so hard to climb a mountain is that gravity is saying, stay down here in the valley. You know, it's pulling on you. And it's like that thing that just wants to keep you at the lowest level in life. And then you see the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And I, a couple chapters back, used the analogy of aerodynamics for that one. The law of aerodynamics. And you see, that's the law of lift, right? That's the thing that makes a plane fly. And, and back there in Romans chapter 6, he talked about some of the same things, about the law of sin and death, which condemns us, and a law of grace, the law of love, the law of Christ, which constrains us and lifts us. And so you see that law of aerodynamics, what's it able to do? It's able to lift a very heavy plane even far above the top of the mountains. One of the things that was so great about living in Colorado is when I'd fly out of there, you'd get to go right over those mountains. You'd get to go over peaks that were higher than 14,000 feet. The highest ones that were there, you'd just look down on them like they were little nothings. And you say, wow, now this is incredible. What a view from here. And the whole deal there is that the law of gravity is not gone, but the law of lift has overtaken it. It's overpowered it. And gravity, it can pull all at once, but that plane is going to fly. And so we see in our lives, you know what? The law of sin and death is not gone. There's a condemnation that can come to your life if you don't live by the law of life in Christ Jesus. That's what's able to lift us. That's the law of love, as the Bible calls it, the law of lift that overcomes sin and death. And see, the gap between what the law of God commands in my life and what I'm able to perform in my own strength is so massive, it's bigger than any mountain. It's infinitely great. It's greater than 14,000 feet in distance. You see, the law condemns me. It, sin condemns me. That's really what you see there. And it's that valley view that says to us, well, huh, look how high God is and look how low I am and I don't think I'll ever know what it is to walk at the holy heights. But see, that's when verse 3 comes in and says, God doesn't condemn you. God does not condemn you. Instead, God condemns sin. See, that's great right there. That's so important. He's going to condemn sin. Why? Because his holiness demands it. God is perfectly holy. He has to command. He has to condemn sin. If he doesn't, he's no longer perfect in holiness. But in his mercy, he doesn't want to condemn you. He doesn't want to condemn me. He doesn't want to condemn anyone. And so the solution comes in sending his son. See, God doesn't any longer see your sin when he looks at you. If you are in Christ, he sees his son. And he doesn't have to condemn sin in you because it was condemned on the cross. The solution was sending his son. You see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Such an important verse to know. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. I'll read it for you. It says, God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus it's talking about there, to be sin. He became sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What an incredible trade took place there on the cross. Jesus' righteousness was given to me and my sinfulness was given to him. Wow, what a deal. Now I can see him saying, that's not fair. But that's not what he said. 
That's not what he said. Sometimes we say that in life. That's not fair. Well, remember, it was not fair for Jesus to take my sin, but he did so. God is so much more than fair. And so Paul continues there in verse 5 and 6 and 7. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because... The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now another contrast here is the mind of Christ and the mind in carnality. Now, what he's talking there about carnal minds. See, this is kind of an ironic thing. Here I am about to give a Spanish lesson, and I'm a gringo from Colorado who got a D in Spanish to a bunch of people who probably many of you don't uh, need to take it. And so I told my teacher way back in school, I will never need to know Spanish. You know, and uh, that shows how much I knew. <laughs> Mr. Roxaday, I'm sorry you were right. But God knew that I at least needed to know this word, carne, carne, meat, right? It's carnal, meat. It's like saying here, hey, don't be a meathead. That's what it's basically saying, don't be meat-minded. To be a meathead is to be death. That's death. What's it talking about? Someone who's just focused on the physical, the fleshly things, the things of gratification, the I, me, mine. And he says if you do that, that's enmity with God. It's being an enemy of God. See, our mind can really, it's like a TV that you can't turn off in a way, but you can change the channel. And you're either going to be on fleshly channel or spiritual channel. And you can change the ch channel by the Spirit of God when he can say, you know what, your mind can go and be fixed upon spiritual things. See, it's a great question to ask yourself. Where does your mind go when it's at rest? You know, when it just kind of goes where it wants to go, does it go to things of the Spirit or does it go to the things of the flesh? See, Paul here is saying that we do face a choice and we need to make a decision to focus not on the fleshly, not on the physical, but on the spiritual things. And that's a life of life and peace, as he says there. Those in the flesh, that's the self-trusting, the self-focused, the self-centered, and that's the Romans 7. Remember, Paul had that I problem, as Pedro put it. I, me, mine. The trinity of stupidity, remember that? I'll never forget that one, I like it. But the, the thing that you see there in chapter 7, something noticeably absent. Oh, I, me, mine is all over it, but the Spirit is nowhere to be found. You're not going to find... A discussion of the Holy Spirit there. But there in Romans 8, it's all over the place. Romans 8, that's really the purpose of the chapter, the point of the chapter, the peak of the spiritual things is the Spirit. No surprise there. But he says to be in the flesh, you cannot please God. Elsewhere in Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what's it talking there? It's talking about that in the flesh, without faith, self-focus, self-ability. thing. he says, without that, with that, there's no way that you can do it. In the self, there's condemnation, there's death. In the spirit, there is life and no condemnation. Now, verse 9, it says, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's not his. Verse 10, and if Christ is in you, the body's dead because of sin, but the spirit, of life, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, the Christian life, though it is impossible uh, in our own power, it's actually quite simple. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, and you can look it up later, but it's just this simple. It says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's really the difference between a bunch of external rules and an internal relationship with God. You see maybe the Gatorade commercials and they ask, is it in you? you know, and that's what's supposed to drive you on to these great heights. But God would say, is he in you? Is he in you? That's really it. If you want to really experience what God wants for your life, it's going to be the question, is he in you? is the Spirit of God himself within you. And catch there in the passage in verse 9, it talks about the Spirit of God. It talks about the Spirit of Christ. It talks about the Holy Spirit all throughout the chapter, used very interchangeably. And there we see the triunity of God. And, 
And you see him with the spiritual power that we need. See, we're an inferior trinity, as many call it. Created by God, body, soul, and spirit. And the body and the soul can be alive, but the spirit can be dead. That's what it is to be a person who does not believe and does not have Christ in you. You'll have a body, physical. You'll have a soul. Yeah, you can have a, a will, a mind, uh, some ideas, maybe even some human goodness to you. But it says in the Bible that your spirit is dead apart from Christ. And so when we are born, we're born body and soul. But when we're born again, we're born again, body, soul, and spirit. And see, this is what's interesting is that God does something with our spirit, but he doesn't always do something with our body when we get saved. Wouldn't it be awesome if you gave your life to the Lord and all of a sudden you look like whoever your ideal is? You know, you're like, whoa, I got to pray that prayer again. That's awesome. We probably have a lot of experiences here with people saying, man, I got to come to Christ so I can look better and be better and stronger and all these things. But that's not what God does. He does something with your spirit. He does something inside that maybe it's not immediately visible, but it will become visible in our lives. It will bear fruit in our lives. See, verse 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh now. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so again, I remind you, it's just a peek at the peak. In many ways, I'm, I'm cruising past many things that, that we should spend lots of time on. We could spend the rest of our lives on it. Let's do that. Keep reading it when you get home. Read it over and over again. And you'll see there that it starts with no condemnation, but instead of condemnation, it says you got something really great, which is adoption. Adoption. See, it says these are the sons of God. See, Jesus was the one and only Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. But there are sons and daughters of God who are adopted into the family. And that's what you see here in verse 14. It's talking about the way that we can become a child of God, part of the family of God. What changed in my life when I did that? Well, I was given the Spirit, the Bible says, and I can now be led by the Spirit. Now, what's an amazing about God is he's always a gentleman, which means he never forces us at any stage of our relationship with him. He's not going to make you be led by the Spirit in the sense that you're now a robot and you don't have a choice. No, but he's now giving you the option. Hey, you didn't used to even have the option of being led by the Spirit, but now you can. Before we were believers, we only had one choice. Follow the flesh, follow the flesh. You know, that was it. But now he says you got a new choice. You can follow the flesh, you can feed the flesh, or you can be led of the Spirit. Led of the Spirit, it's going to take you in a totally different direction. And I like to illustrate this point with a, a dog walking service. Two big dogs, one named Spirit, one named Flesh. Now, Flesh, as you probably can imagine, is no little chihuahua, right? But neither is the Spirit. The Spirit is big. In fact, even bigger than the Flesh. But you see, what if you were to begin to starve Spirit and feed Flesh? Months and months go by. Years go by. Oh, you've got both. You've got Spirit. You've got Flesh. But now spirit's kind of becoming weak and tired and frail and sickly in your life. And flesh, meanwhile, is strong and robust and well-fed. Well, if you take those two dogs on a walk, which one of those dogs is going to lead? The very simple answer, the one you feed is the one that will lead. The one you feed is the one that will lead. And so the solution in our lives, if we want to truly be day-to-day -day led by the spirit, is to feed the spirit and starve the flesh. And see, that's a good question for us to consider. Who's leading in my life? Who's really leading in my life? Not just, hey, am I a Christian or not? Those are interesting questions. Those are important questions. But who is leading your life? Are we led by the Spirit? Are we feeding the flesh? See, Romans 8 tells us that by our adoption, we have a means now. We have been given the Spirit. And we have now an opportunity to let him lead our lives to the peak, to the upper things, to the higher things, the upward path, not the downward spiral. See, the destination of the flesh is death. And you see that even, as I've said many times, forgiven sin still hurts. It still drags you down. It still drags down the people around you. And God wants to lead us by his spirit into a different way of living. The destination of the spirit is joy and peace, life. That's what it talks about here. Now, verse 15, it says, 
you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. See, there it is again. No condemnation, instead, adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, some of you are maybe of uh, similar age to me. You think Abba, and you think of a singing group that you'd rather forget. But that's not what it is here. We're going to explain what it is. The, the spirit in himself, it says, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. See that? There's the spirit of God, and in there, he's given life to our spirit, and they're both in there in verse 16, that we are children of God. And it says, if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, and if indeed we suffer with him. Oh, man, why has it always got to say stuff like that? That we also may be glorified together with him. See, verse 15 talks about something so important, the spirit of adoption. Abba, it says there, Father. That's what it means, a more accurate Translation, maybe, is daddy or poppy, one of those terms of endearment for kids. See, I don't like it when my kids call me Scott. Sometimes they do that. You know, hey, Scott. I what? Do not call me Scott. See, the whole world can call me Scott. Everybody can call me Scott. Even telemarketers can call me Scott. But only three people in the whole world can properly call me by that name, daddy. See, there's some special relationship being discussed there, signaled by that word. And many right away would say, well, I don't want even to think of God as my father because you don't understand what my physical father was like or how my parents didn't do this or didn't do that. But see, that's the very point here. It talks about adoption. What a privilege that is. See, my sister used to tell me I was adopted. I wasn't. But she used to always tell me that. And even if I had been, and even if you have been, see, I had an adopted friend. My best friend, really, was uh, dating a girl who was adopted. And so I grew up knowing the two of them very well. They're married today, but she was adopted, and she had this great confidence. It was awesome because she used to say to people, you know what? Every other parent had to take whatever they got. My parents got to pick me. And so you think about that. Wow, what an understanding that is. All of a sudden, it's like, well, somebody rejected me. Yeah, but somebody accepted you. Somebody handpicked you. And so their adoption, what does it mean? A child by choice. Somebody who said, this was a wanted one. That's the one I want right there. Now, some get very puffed up with pride about this doctrine somehow. They get excited about it and they start, oh, chosen, <laughs> yes. But remember, the Bible says, God picks the foolish and the weak things. Oh, okay. But see, the point here is that you weren't adopted by accident. He didn't say, oh, no, no, not that one. You know, when, when somebody gives their life to the Lord, he didn't, no, 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 I didn't want that one. No, what you see is very simply, it just boils down to this. God loves you. He wanted you. He wants you. You're his child by choice. You can know that. Verse 16, it says you're an heir. You've got an inheritance. And many, if they're meat-headed, uh, immediately begin to think right here, carnally-minded, yes, I'm adopted in, I get the inheritance. Come on, God, I know you got a lot of gold. Start giving some of it to me. But you know what? You see in verse 17, what did Jesus, the Son of God, experience? Seven, 17, it says suffering. Jesus got the crown. Oh, he did, and we will too. But he got it by way of the cross, by way of suffering. See, the cross always comes before the crown. And there's many, many who want to put the crown before the cross and forget all about the cross if we can. But the crown always comes after the cross. And so you see that adoption going on there. But there's also an adaptation. There's something that God needs to do. He, did, he adopted us into the family, but just like if I were to be suddenly adopted into a royal family, guess what? There would be a few things that needed to change in my life. I might actually have to learn which of those 16 forks you have to use and stuff like that. You know, I don't know any of that stuff. And so there's going to be some changes that come by coming into this family. And verse 18, it says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. Now, this takes us to our 
next word, which is expectation. We talked about no condemnation. That's good. Adoption, yeah. Expectation. See, verse 22, he gives a, an analogy there in the scripture. He talks about birth pains. That's even how we use the word, right? We talk about someone who's pregnant. We say she's an expectant mother. She's expectant. She's got an expectation. Now, what is she expecting? She's expecting a baby. But get this, she's also expecting pain. There's always pain before a child is born. And so there's that expectation, and that's what Paul is talking about here. Oh, there's going to be a glorious thing. But the process might hurt a little. See, the pain there, there's a purpose in it. And so, so many people, this is one of their big questions that they say keeps them from Christ. Well, if God is so good, why is there so much suffering in the world? Read Romans. Read Romans 8. Take a peek at the peak right here. He says, because we're living in an expectation right now. Creation is not as God created it. God created it good, the Bible says in Genesis 1 and 2. And yet, you see, sin made it bad. Sin made it bad. And I don't want to ruin sunsets for you. I really like them. It's one of the things I love to see off a mountain or in the oceans or whatever. But you know what? It's pollution that really produces sunsets. Do you know that? The more pollution there is in the area, sometimes you'll get these glorious, colorful things, and you go, ah, well, that's really all the emissions and different things that make it that way. And I think that's a glorious picture of God's grace. He takes man's worst and does his best with it. It's amazing what he can do. And think about all of nature. See, sometimes we look at it and we think, oh, nature, it's so wonderful. You know, we take our kids to something. And the other day I took our, our daughter, Lynn, and I did to uh, the Science Museum. And Carissa's looking at the cute little mousey. Oh, yeah, they bring out the little mousey. And then guess what? A snake ate it. Just, bleh, you know, one bite. I'm like, man, brutal. That's brutal, you know? The little mousey is gone. But you see all these things with mudslides and tornadoes and fires and earthquakes and hurricanes and droughts and all these things that are going on. And people, the insurance companies, you know what they do? They blame it on God. Acts of God. You know, you're not covered for any of those things. You buy insurance, but then all those things are excluded. If anything happens to you, you're not covered. And those are acts of God. But you know what? Those aren't acts of God. Those are the result of acts of Adam. See, if we've got to blame someone, we can blame him and we can blame ourselves. An act of God is dying for my sin, to pay the price for it, to redeem me and the fallen world that I live in. See, this is what's great. Adam fell, the world fell with him. But guess what? God's going to redeem not only us, but the world. You see Revelation chapter 20, the age of, called the millennium in the Scripture. A thousand years in which Christ will reign upon the earth. Go look at that, and after that, a time of eternity, whatever that means, all eternity after that. But God will even bring back the creation to the beginning, to the place where it started. And you see in verse 23, it says not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. See, this is important because I was setting my eyes on the summit as I was going up that mountain. I'm like, that's my hope. That's my hope to get there. But when I stood there, I didn't say, well, I hope I make it to the top. I, I, whoa, I'm here. There's no longer any need for the hope that I might because there I am. And see, that's what he's saying in verse 15. He says, we've received the spirit of adoption. That's past tense, verse 15. But then in verse 23, he says, but we're eagerly waiting for adoption. That's a future tense. And some would say, well, which one is it, Paul? Yes, it's both. It's that I have been adopted and I will be adopted. And the answer to that seeming contradiction there is found in verse 23. It talks about the first fruits of the spirit. See, God, what God has already done in my life is only the beginning of what he has promised to do. This is so far as glorious as it is, just a foreshadowing, just a peek at the peak. See, we haven't even begun to understand all that God has and will do for us. Elsewhere, Paul says that God gave us the spirit, his spirit inside us as a down payment, just a down payment. He says, but the whole transaction is coming and one day soon we'll not only have the spirit of Christ within us, but we will have a glorified body that goes along with it perfectly. 
just like Jesus, inside and out. That's the promise of Scripture. And See, when God remodels a life, yeah, he starts on the inside. He goes in there first. And if you've ever been involved in a remodeling project or a, of a house or something, you know this little thing. It gets worse before it gets better. And it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse before it gets better. You know, it's one of those things that you think it's home improvement, but it looks like home destruction by the end. And, and last year we had our floors redone at our house and we replaced some worn out carpet that the uh, kids had pretty much you know, put every stain known to man on. And it was kind of multicolored and it looked a little too 70s for us. So we, we said, okay, we're gonna laminate this. We're, gonna, we're just gonna get this taken care of. And the thing was, I called this friend who's able to do it and he said, I can fit you in, but it's gotta be tomorrow. I've got a cancellation, I can fit you in tomorrow and you need to move all the furniture in the house right now. So it was total chaos that night. Basically, I was up most of the night getting the room ready and stuff just stacked everywhere. I mean, where do you put it? Because the whole floor is being redone. So it's just everywhere, all, anywhere that I could make a pile, there it was. And I began to think during the night, is this worth it? Is this worth it? And then they got there in the morning and the first thing they did is they made things worse. They ripped out the carpet. You know, and there's just dust flying everywhere and all that kind of stuff. And then they bring in a bunch of tools, right? inside the house. Now, my mom never let me bring power tools inside the house, but these guys get to do it, and they bring it in, and they bring in all the laminate, and it's everywhere in the place, and they started sawing, and just sawdust everywhere, and that of the saw, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and they had to open the doors and turn off the air conditioner because it's clogging the filter and everything. I'm like, this is crazy. Our house never looked so bad. I mean, why, why are we doing this? And that week seemed to take forever. It was one week but it seemed like forever. Now, when the work was in progress, I was really wishing things were just back to the old carpet. I'm like, it wasn't that bad. I go back to the old carpet. You know, it's still out in the driveway. Maybe I can bring it back in. But now that the floors are finished, man, I barely remember the process. I kind of do if I really think about it, but really I just, oh, wow. Look at, oh, those floors, they look so good. Oh, man, you drop something on it, it doesn't stain. Oh, this is great, you know. And everyone who comes into our house says, oh, I like the floors. Oh, when did you get the floor? These are not, oh, yeah, it was no big deal. You know, <laughs> you can do it too. You know, here's this number. It'll be great. And see, in the same way, a God, he comes into our heart. And he makes it his home. And you know what he does? Right away, he starts the remodeling job. And people are, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> Ripping things out, bringing some stuff new in. And I remind you, sometimes things got to get a lot worse before they get better. See, I got saved and in a way, things got worse in some ways. That things got kind of crazy and chaotic, and maybe you could say the same. Part of your thing, well, th my testimony, hey, I left the, led a pretty normal life, and then I got saved, and boom, everything went nuts. And I began to say, why is this, ha why was I doing this again? But see, the value of the view is often related to what we went through, what we went through to get there. And many people don't even value the view. They'll look at no condemnation, they go, eh, that's cool. Adoption, yeah, that's, that's fine. You know, but when you start seeing these things, the expectation, God's doing a great work in my life. And if it's going, if it looks this bad now, man, it must kind of look really good. And so that's what it has to do with first fruits. They're mentioned in Romans 8, 23, expectation. See, the first fruits was a Jewish feast, and it was a feast of expectation. It was one in which they would take the very first grain that would come, and they say, let's celebrate now, because God's promised a full harvest. We don't have to wait for it. We don't have to wait to party. We got an expectation right now. And see, that's what Paul is saying here in Romans 8. He's saying, you can begin to celebrate now just because God's given you the down payment of the Spirit and it's just a little foretaste. It's just a peak, of the, a peak at the peak, a little bitty glimpse of what's ahead for us. And God's not only going to remodel and redeem and deal with our inside. Oh, he is going to deal with our outside, our physical body, the Bible says just as much of a promise that as he is dealing with the inside, he's going to deal with the outside. God will be faithful. See, but he's given us a new spirit and an old body. Have you noticed that? The Bible says he's given us this treasure in jars of clay. And outwardly, let me give you my translation of what he says there, we're going from bad to worse. But then he says inwardly, we're going from worse to great to better. When the body dies, my redeemed spirit is going to get a perfect place to live, a glorified body. And until then, we groan. That's what verse 23 says, we groan. When I was growing up, now I'm grown, I guess, but when I was growing up, 
I used to wonder why my grandparents groaned every time they stood up or sat down. I don't know if you remember that from growing up, but grandpa would sit in his chair and, oh, you know, and then he'd get up again, oh. You know, but now it's starting to make sense. See, I'm not quite there. Mine's more a little, oh, oh, oh. But, you know, you get to, oh, sometimes, whoa. And the thing is, my kids, they're young, but sometimes they'll even say, man, I'm sore. My eight-year-old, or when he was eight-year-old, he's now 12, just turned 12 the other day, but Stephen said to me once, I'm tired of this old body. He was eight years old. Tired of this old body? I'll trade you, you know. But this passage here, it promises us that God is going to give us something so much better. See, it talks there about the hope in verse 24 and 25, and he says, you don't have to hope once you have it but you will have it. That's what he's basically saying there. Who hopes for what they have? And what he's telling us is that heaven is going to be a hopeless place. Heaven's going to be a faithless place. And right away, someone say, hopeless, faithless, what are you talking about? Well, see, hope looks forward to what it doesn't have. But there in heaven, we'll have it. We don't need hope. Faith looks forward to what is unseen and sees the unseen. But guess what? We won't need faith in heaven. The only thing left will be love. That's why Paul, when he put out those three words in 1 Corinthians 13, he said the greatest of these is love because heaven will be a hopeless place, a faithless place, but it won't be a loveless place. The only thing left will be oceans and oceans of love. And so you see faith becoming sight. What's far away being face to face. That's what I experienced there physically on that mountain. The thing that had once seemed <laughs> totally impossible. There we stood. And that's what the expectation is. And then he takes us to intercession. Intercession. You see that in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now what we've seen in this chapter is three groans, right? You saw... Creation groaning, oh, can't wait to be redeemed. You see Christians groaning, oh, this new spirit is nice, but Lord, the new body's going to be even better along with it. And then you see God groaning. Isn't that interesting? It's the Holy Spirit here that says praying with groans. Uh, sometimes they'll look at our life, uh, you know. And verse 26 says we need help. Can we agree with that? Weaknesses? Especially in the area of prayer, it says at the beginning of the chapter, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But you know what? If you want to make a Christian feel guilty, mention prayer. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, hey, how's your prayer life? Mm, condemnation, you know? No, no, that's what this whole passage here is supposed to show us. God knows we're weak. He knows the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. He knows that even his apostles slept through the prayer meetings. You know, and he's saying here, you know what? Even if your prayer life stinks, and whose prayer life is all that it could be? Well, one, even if your prayer life stinks, God has a very good prayer life. Even when you're not praying to him, he's praying for you. Isn't that awesome? He's interceding for you. What a prayer partner we've got here. It says the Holy Spirit of God. Well, I guess God might answer those prayers. Yeah. And so as the Lord and I have groaned together, you know what? We've grown together. There's many times where I didn't even know how to pray or what to say or anything else. I just, <clears throat> Lord. And he says, yeah, that's the very prayer I was praying to. <clears throat> but, you know, together, God's will, God's work, it gets done there through these things. Verse 28, that intercession, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And this is such a great verse here. And the thing is, for many, it's a false peak. See, I mentioned false peaks along the trip. Sometimes you see these things that you think are really the top of the truth, but they're really not. And sometimes Christians are guilty of having trite truths. You know, things that aren't really in the Bible, or at least not all of it is, and they say things like, well, you know, God works in mysterious ways, or whatever, or all things work together for good, and that's kind of, you know, even people who don't read the Bible, oh, all things work together for good, I'm sure this will work out, you know, or whatever. But it says so much more in this verse. A higher truth, much higher truth. Not trite at all. It's the higher truth that w those who love God and are called according to his purpose, see, his purpose is that they would be conformed to Christ. That's what's good. See, sometimes we have a whole definition of good, but God's definition of good is anything that makes us more like Christ. That's good. 
And so sometimes we're waiting for that, well, God's going to work this to good. You know, everything will work out really swimmingly in the end. But see, sometimes it's the conformity to Christ that we say, oh, that's the good he wanted? Yeah, that's the good he's going for. That's the goal he has. You see it in verse 29. It says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now, you see five words there. Foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Those are really something that you could sit on that view for a long time. And many get very caught up in these things and like to have doctrinal debate, debates and division over them. And we will talk some more about some of these different things as we go through some of the following chapters in Romans because it deals with it. But what am I going to say about these things now? I think the best thing to say is what Paul says in verse 31. What shall we say to these things? And Paul gives us the answer. If God is for us, who can be against us? Wow, if you, if you can't figure out and I can't figure out for new predestined, called, justified, glorified, uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? See, that's what those all boil down to. God is for us. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how, can, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? See, that's the top of the mountain of truth right there. God is for us. If we just understand that God is for me, Sometimes we think God is against us. No, we'd know. If God was against us, there would be no hope for us. God is for us. From before the beginning, that's what it's talking about there, with the foreknowledge, to the after the end, as he talks about glorified, everything in between, God is for us. And the proof is always found in the same picture. Verse 32, God did not spare his own son. See, love songs often promise, oh, I'll go to the highest mountain for you, baby, you know, and then you ask them to get water from the fridge and they say, ah, get it yourself. You know, but <laughs> I'd climb the highest mountain for you. But the most important mountain may not have been the highest mountain. See, Jesus went to the Mount of Calvary, as it's called, the hill of the skull there on a cross, and that's the important ma matter here, the mountain that matters most. That's the view that we all need to value. See, some do say in life, oh, God doesn't love me, or he could prove it by this. And you know what happens? We have a tendency to make molehills into mountains. Mountains out of molehills. But see, Romans 8 kind of takes every mountain in life and makes it a molehill compared to this. The top of Mount Calvary says, there, take a peek at that. Take a peek at that peak. God gave you his son. Don't ever lose sight of that. If God would give me a promotion at work, then he'd prove that he loved me. No, he already did prove that he loved you when he gave his son. See, Paul's point is that when God has given his best, we can trust him for all the rest. If, if that, he did not withhold the very best that he had, how could he withhold anything? And so verse 33, it says, who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore also has risen who is even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Remember, that's one of our blessings there, intercession. He says, no condemnation, adoption. You get to be part of the family. There's an expectation. There's a whole lot more than we've already seen. And he says, intercession. You got God on your side. And earlier in this chapter, it said the Holy Spirit was interceding for us in groans. But here in verse 34, it says, Jesus is interceding for us. Given for us, but given to us. Are you starting to see? Are you starting to understand? A little glimpse. Am I starting to see it? That God is for me. God is for me. See, Romans 8, it started with no condemnation, and it ends here with no separation. That's where I want to think on those th thoughts as we go our way tonight. 35 there, verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword and he goes on to say, hey, it's even said in the Bible, for your sake we're killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, God never promised us a rose garden. He says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, when the three of us, my friends and I, we got to the top of that 14,000 foot peak there, we celebrated, man. We jumped and shouted as if we had been the first and only people to ever make it because we had conquered. We didn't care if others had conquered or not. You know, we conquered that mountain. But see, what he's saying there in verse 37, we're more than conquerors. 
the Greek word is funny. It, it actually is hyper-conqueror is the word, like mega hyper-conqueror. It's so many words munched all in there together. And he's saying, through Jesus, it wasn't your effort that got you to the top of that mountain. See, don't misunderstand the analogy and start to think that we can climb our way to God or that we can, uh, through just pressing on, we'll eventually make it to heaven. No, not at all. See, the Bible says it's our faith in Christ that overcomes the world, not our blood, sweat, and tears. It was his, not ours. But Jesus promised that we would share in his glory, but that we would also share in his suffering, that there'd be some of that along the way for us. And see, those views, those views of these things, I think we value them a little more when we see what Jesus went through for them and what we may go through to really fully understand them and embrace them. See, Paul, he went through some of these things and he knew it from experience. Verse 38, he said, I'm persuaded. In other words, I've come to learn this that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing out there is going to be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it started with no condemnation. It ends with no separation, not now, not ever. There's no need for any of us to fear what's in the past in our life, coming back to condemn us with God. There's nothing in the present that can separate us from God, and there will be nothing in the future that can do it, physical or spiritual or otherwise. God is for us. He sent his son for us, and we've only just begun. We've only taken a little peek at the peak. And doesn't that make you hungry for heaven to realize, oh, this is just getting started? See, many Christians, sadly, I think they live in the valley view, kind of that carnal Christian, you know, just enough Jesus to make you miserable but not enough to really lift you and take you to the heights. It's like two guys on a tandem bicycle. I want to leave this picture in our brains here. A bicycle built for two. You know, you've seen them. And they're going up this mountain, you know, a lot, nice hill there. And halfway up, the guy in the front stops and turns and says, man, I don't think I can keep pedaling anymore. But I'm afraid we'll fall back if I don't keep pedaling. And the guy said, yeah, I was afraid of that too. That's why I kept the brakes on the whole time. <laughs> See, that's how so many people live the Christian life. They're either pedaling as hard as they can. I'll just, I know I can make it. Or they're putting the brakes on, just hoping, oh God, just don't let me fall. Just don't let me fall. But see, the whole thing is not putting the brakes on, but a breakthrough, a breakthrough that you see right here. If you're at the bottom of the mountain, well, there's those who maybe have never even come to Christ, and tonight you just need to do that. It's just that simple. Just Christ in me. Lord, I open my heart. I invite you inside. And he will honor that. But you know what? There's so many who still just say, well, that's the end, right? I did it? No. no that's just the beginning. See, to go on to get to know him with that Abba Father, that he's my daddy, that he's my poppy, that there are hills to climb with him, that there are Hills that he climbed for me that only he could do. But there's hills to climb with him. There's peaks to see with him. And see, Paul, in this Romans road here, he took us up that mountain. And he says, hey, what's it going to mean to you? How are you going to value this view? Will it just be another night, a nice verse, nice view? <laughs> or will it be what it was meant to be, which is a life-changing thing that we say, hey, my destination is never going to be the same. My understanding of God is never going to be the same. I'm not going to go through life as a Christian meathead, you know, carnally minded. I'm not going to live in Romans 7. I don't have to do that. I'm going to flee to the 8th chapter of Romans where I belong. See, and that's what Paul did. He said, wretched man that I am. And he didn't say what's going to deliver me, what 10 steps are going to deliver me. He said, who? See, it's not how, it's who. It's Christ in you. And that's a peak at the peak. And you know what? Sometimes in life, we want to live there, even as Peter said, let's build tabernacles here and stay up here on the top of the mountain. But you know what? The view from the top is supposed to get us to where even when we're in the valley of the shadow of death, we see God differently and we see ourselves differently. We see no condemnation. Hey, even when I'm in the valley of my own fault, there's no condemnation. Why? Because I'm adopted. I'm handpicked by God. That's the one I want. I'm his child by choice. He made the choice. I made the choice to respond to that. And you see intercession, God praying for me. That sounds kind of funny, but that's what he's doing. Praying for me. God pulling for me. Talking to himself about me and about you. And there's no separation. Nothing can ever come between me 
and God ever. Not now, not ever. And that's a view that's worth any trip. See, if we reach that peak bruised and beaten and scratched and hungry and thirsty, that only means we're going to value that view more. Is there a shortcut up the back, some of you are saying? Man, I don't know it. I haven't seen it. But you know what? By God's Spirit, this doesn't have to just be theoretical theology. It can become a practical reality in your life. I'm going to ask just the guys who are playing tonight in the, in the worship team to come up. We're going to close in a song. But there'll be some folks up here to pray uh, with you. And if there are those of you who've maybe even accepted Christ and you've done that in your life, but you say, man, there's still got to be something more. Well, there is in a sense because Jesus said, yes, I'll be in you, but I can be upon you. I can be flowing out through you. And that's an opportunity that we don't want to miss. We're leaky vessels. We're holy in the sense that we have holes sometimes. And it just tends to go like that. And you say, Lord, fill me afresh. Fill me anew. If there's anyone who needs to pray that, either from your seat or you need someone to agree in prayer with you, there'll be folks up here at the front. God bless you.